Hey folks, here we are talking with Russ Scala. I'm Trent Duncan. We're going to cover a bunch of series of hot topics uh, ranging around the medical news that's, uh, that you're seeing out here on the internet and, and stuff that's uh, really making headway in uh, a lot of uh, news segments, blogs, news articles, and that kind of stuff. We'll be talking all sorts of stuff from icon intimidation, addictions, testosterone, fasting, and Russ is going to give us his expert opinion on all these topics and kind of where he's coming from, from his genetic testing background. So. Let's uh let's get into uh let's get into some action here. You ready? Yeah, let's do this. All right, we got a long talk ahead of ourselves, so uh you know stick with us there, right? <laughs> we won't all put anybody to sleep. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, okay, so Russ, let's do a, little, a little bit about your history, so people know kind of where you're coming from. You were raised around doctors and physicians, and so you know about that icon intimidation, how people hold doctors up on a pedestal. Tell us a little bit about where you come from in that aspect. I mean, for 200 years, you know, we've been passive recipients of healthcare. We sat there and listened to the doctor, mm -hmm. and he told us what to do. Well, well, now that's all changing. A recent book um, on the market written by Eric Topol called, called The Patient Will See You Now is about people making their own decisions and taking charge of their health with, you know, the devices that they're wearing, like the Fitbit Absolutely. and everything like that. Um, I use the word I icon intimidation where even back when I was a paramedic, I started going to advanced cardiac life support classes on what drugs to give cardiac arrest patients, and I was going to these classes with emergency room physicians. So in my mind, I was thinking back then, well, I thought they knew this, yeah. mm -hmm. but they didn't. And if you understand the training that a physician has and understand the, the hours they go through training for 4,000 hours, a, a lot of times they don't, they don't have the answers for folks when it comes to diet or hormonal replacement therapy. You know, they, they, they look at the basics and, uh, you know, a lot of people today, they go into their doctor's office with, you know, complaints and they end up going on a two-year journey. And a lot of times what, what we're doing with Scala Precision Health and what we're doing with the Russ Scala YouTube channel is we're educating people on what questions to ask their doctor. And again, we're not, we're not shooting down doctors, but they, they, they have a limited amount of training. Um, when, when a doctor is in his third year of residency, as an example, He's able to start writing prescriptions, and where is he? He's in the hospital dealing with sick people, and that model is, you know, symptom medication. If you go to the doctor, like we just did some advanced testing yeah. on you, we're looking at all your nutritional levels, your intestinal tract, we're looking at multiple metabolic markers that a doctor wouldn't look at. So when people go into a physician's a doctor's, you know, they, they hopefully they think or they have icon intimidation, like, okay, I'm going to get all, all, all that I need, and that a lot of times isn't the case. A lot of folks over 40 get put on four or five different medications. They get taken down, you know, a, a road where their symptoms are being treated by multiple physicians who aren't talking to each other. So that's a 60,000-foot view of where, of, of where we need to go um, education-wise. Well, what I've seen, what I've kind of heard a lot, <clears throat> is that doctors, they're just so busy seeing so many people that they only have so much time with you. So... I know when I've went and talked to my doctor and, you know, I've asked him some of the tougher questions, I was kind of surprised. He, he knew some of the answers to it, but he just didn't lead on to that because he just, you know, didn't think they had the time. And it takes time for the doctor to educate a patient, and they don't have the time no, to good. sit in the room to educate them. So they just do what they're supposed to do and play it safe and assume the patient is just kind of borderline average on their knowledge level. And unless they ask the tough questions, then they start, you know, helping out and impeding a little Exactly. Doctors, listen, doc, some of the doctors I know, listen, I got, I got physicians that are my best friends. I got physicians on this program right now. They got to see 30 people a day to pay yeah. the bills. That, that leaves them only 10 minutes yeah. with, a, you know, with a patient. So how are you really going to drill down and find out what's wrong with somebody in 10 minutes? Our medical system's broken. So I want to educate people so in that 10 minutes they can ask the tough questions and they don't go on this. Like a lot of my clients have been on a two-year journey yeah. not getting any answers. I mean, they're upset. They're pissed. They're frustrated, and then they come, they come to us, or they come to me, and they go, well, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. hey, and you're not a doctor. Mm -hmm. I go, I have a team, researchers, <laughs> I have a lab, you know. You I got to have go. a lab coat. You can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the, the whole idea of understanding physiologically that we have to pull the puzzle pieces together. I mean, look at all. Look, we told people for 30 years that fat caused heart attacks. Yeah. It doesn't. That's all changing now. That, that's all changing in real time. And Whoops, made a mistake. Yeah, billions were made on cholesterol-lowering drugs. Now we know statin drugs are cholesterol-lowering drugs, damage the brain and the heart. So every person, every elderly person that went on a cholesterol-lowering drug compromised his brain. Well, well, thanks a lot for that. Yeah. So well, we want to avoid that in the future. Yeah, I'd like to avoid That's good. Uh, so let's get back just a little bit about your history as a paramedic. 
uh, you dealt with a lot of addiction, PSD kind of stuff. I mean, the movie The Hurt Locker comes to mind when you were talking about that. Tell us a little about some of the addiction that you saw, PTSD, whether it be with some of the patients or some of the members of your SWAT team or doctors, how they got burnt out. Yeah, the, well, I was one of them. I was, like, addicted. To, I mean, we were drinking. I was drinking so much. I, I Thank God I found triathlons as an alternative. But let, 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 let me just tell you what, you know, what happened. We were the first group of paramedics to hit the street. So you've got the NASA program that came up with telemetry to measure the heart rate. You've got, you know, everything that came out of the Vietnam War with the medics working on, on victims and shooting victims all came together with this paramedic program. So I was working in the emergency room at the time, and a few of the do doctors said, you know, we're going to take this emergency room and move it to the street. And that's what you wrote a book on. Tell us a little bit about that, because people that was back when people didn't know you can come to their house with all this equipment to help fix them up. Yeah, exactly. So I, I wrote a book called called Critical Seconds, and, and basically, this is what happened. This is really interesting. We had all this fancy equipment. We were rolling into somebody's house. I would hook them up to a monitor. I'd have a drug box with me where I could drink, you know, I could give them medications to start their heart and save their life on the scene. Mm -hmm. It was all new, okay? Well, people weren't trained because they still were used to an ambulance coming to their house and taking their husband or wife to the hospital. Yeah. So we came in with all this fancy equipment, and the people are going, take them to the hospital. What are you doing wasting time here? So we didn't educate the public mm. on what, what our new procedures were. So I, I wrote that book basically to critical seconds. When you call 911 and hang up the phone, what can you do before the, before the paramedics arrive? Yeah. Like we bring in so much equipment, you need to clear an area. We actually bring the emergency room into the house. Yeah. So I learned early on in my career that you've got to educate people. I learned early on that we were the newest guys in the street, and man, it caused a lot of hassles. I mean, emergency room doctors and nurses, there's always a war between us. We were just trying to save lives, and, and it was so new, we were on the tip of the spear saving lives. Um, been part of that evolution, though, must Yeah, been and, and I've always been like out on the tip of the spear, and, and you take a beating when you're out there. Yeah. You know, I was really <laughs> young. I, I, you know, they moved me into the fire service where um, I'm working in a in a in a in a 200 year tradition unaffected by progress. So they put me on, they moved me into a fire service, and they pay me more money than some of the lieutenants that have been there for 20 years. So they're like, you know, who are these guys? Mm -hmm. You know, who are these new paramedics? Well, in reality, all the protection systems, there was no more fires. So the fire departments had to jump on emergency medicine because, you know, it was going to keep them, you know, keep them in existence because there was no more fires due to the protection systems. So. It, it, there was a lot of changes going on. It was a it, it was a new beginning. Um, one of the doctors that worked out of a Boston hospital developed the trauma center concept because he took all the very traumatized victims, shootings, stabbings, uh, severe auto accidents, and he brought them into a room that he designed it would work on them. And his design went viral across the United States as the trauma center concept that, yeah. that that's in every hospital right now. So the times were were very exciting and then I, I loved it because I got to move the emergency room into the streets. I was giving people drugs, watching their reaction. I was saving lives sometimes and people were dying in in the arms of my crew and myself. The only thing, you know, I loved about it was is was the scenes were constantly changing and I didn't understand the detrimental effects on how it was affecting me. Like right. the heart, the body, because there's an adrenaline rush that goes with Oh, that yeah, it's too. addicting, yeah. It was like I would, you know, we would be off work and we'd be drinking, trying to deal with all the stuff that we saw. Um, you know, we were, we were men. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we, were, we were drinking a lot and, and, and obviously not going to counseling like, like we should. You know, I had a buddy commit suicide, and after that I got placed on the critical incident stress debriefing team. But, you know, I would, I would be off work trying to deal with everything, drinking alcohol, just w with the group. Yeah. And then I would call call in. I go, hey, you know, I want to come back into work. I want to start running more emergency calls because I was so jacked into that high intense scene. So I knew I knew the drinking was bad, but, you know, my peer group was doing it. We were camaraderie, you know, it was like cops and firemen, you know the deal. But I, I knew it was bad, so I would call up some of my, uh, uh, my partners, my lieutenants, and say, hey, l let me come in and work a shift so that way I would – I would, as long as I was running emergency calls and constantly being jacked in, you know, I was fine. But, you, you know, know, that you, high, that high. Yeah, right? it was. And, and you can't live that way. That, that's no. why I understand war vets. I understand professional athletes. I understand people that um, gravitate towards high-stress environments. I totally get that. And, and it's not healthy. My brain couldn't deal with dead air. 
Okay. Like if I, if, if, you know, I couldn't deal with dead air. I'd ha either be drinking, you know, thank God I found exercise. Yeah, I'd triathlons be, and stuff. Yeah, I, yeah, and then I'd be, I'd be dead now. Let me get know? to that in a minute. Tell me about uh, the, uh, the car crash, Carver's telephone pole. Yeah, I, attention to detail. Yeah, Less exactly. And you, you learn early on in this business that nothing is as it seems. And, and I carry that with me all through life. One of my first calls as a paramedic, we blow out of the station and it's a car versus telephone pole. I arrive on the scene with my crew. I'm in charge. You know, I, I, the guy has a compound fracture. He's having trouble breathing. First thing we do is stabilize his neck. I, I zero in on the compound fracture with a bone coming through his arm. You know, that was, you know, that wasn't going to kill him. But back then I was like overwhelmed. So I took, you know, we, we got this guy packaged up in about 15 minutes. You know, we got to check the scene, make sure there's no gas leaks. We got him out of the vehicle, neck stabilized, zoom. And we go to the hospital. Um, the doctor was evaluating the guy in the emergency room staff. And he says, who brought this patient in? And I raised my hand being so proud. And he says, the, he said, this gentleman shot three times in the chest. So I totally missed the, the small caliber bullet wounds. And, you know, I was like 18 years old and... I remember all eyes came on me on how I missed that. And, and those are the things that stay with you. Yeah. Never again did I miss anything like that. And, and, you know, when you drive to an auto accident scene, I thought the car ran into a telephone pole. This guy was shot somewhere else, got in his car to try to drive to the hospital, ran into a pole. I got caught up in, in watching in, in the scene, mm -hmm. thinking it was a car versus telephone pole, totally missed the, the, the bullet wounds to the chest, totally embarrassed in, in, the, in the emergency room and, you know, and, and that's and that's part of the evolution of, uh, you know, I carry that, those same things with me today when I'm working with clients. It's like I'm looking at their history. I'm doing a discovery. I'm getting their backstory. Whether it's an executive or a professional athlete, I get their backstory. Listen, 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 listen. I don't say, say much. And I pull the puzzle pieces together with that thought in my head. Um, can't miss anything. That's important. You know? That's important. Exactly. Tell us a little bit about your triathlon career before we go into uh, some signature pharmacy stuff. So talk about being a triathlete and how that affected your mind, body, and then you dealt well, with that. Well, right, a, right away, like I said, I knew I, I knew I had to start doing something to to stop the drinking and stuff. And that, you know, there's something called social neurobiology, which mm -hmm. means the people that you hang out with can affect your brain chemistry and can affect your health. Oh, sure. <laughs> right? Sure, a lot of people. So I can, I, can say, I can tell you a few stories about that. But anyway, I knew I had to find a different peer group, and I did. I, I was lucky enough to hang out with a bunch of exceptional athletes, professional athletes, and, and start triathlon training really early in the 80s. And that allowed me to get away from all the trauma okay. that I was seeing, and it allowed me to deal with um, compartmentalizing myself in a sport that sort of had its own addictive properties, but... Yeah. It, but <laughs> But healthy, healthier, you know, healthy, healthier, healthy, healthier. Ish. Well, I mean, I, I, I damage my body racing, but, you know, I guess I'm an extremist. But to, to get away from the emergency calls and to get away from that, that group of people um, it was very healthy for me. So, and also, you know, I'm given drugs on the emergency scene, and then um, I really knew about the physiology. So when I moved over to the triathlon training, I was able to say, okay, I know about low blood sugar. I know about carbohydrates. Yeah. I, know, I know about protein. You know, I know how the body works physiologically. I'm giving drugs in the street. Well, a lot of my training as a paramedic, I transferred over to the performance side okay. for the triathletes. And we were, we were doing testosterone testing back in the 80s because I knew if you were racing and you're elevating cortisol, that was going to shut off all your hormones. So, and nobody was looking at that yet. So, um, so you get to and, a lot of blood Yeah, in fact, in fact, this guy, Tim yeah, Noakes. The, All the carbs. Yeah, he was, a, he was a Dalai Lama of endurance training. This is like the Bible of training and um, – Talking about In what 80s, to eat, right? and he, you know, he's he's changing his position right now. He used to be a high carb guy. Okay. Now he's saying high fat. I mean, 2016, he's changed. He actually went on YouTube and gave a presentation saying he was wrong. I mean, how many wow. guys would do that? I mean, you know, I love this guy. Especially when you write a and, giant book like that. Yeah, and he, he even he even says that back in the day, like my heroes were Mark <laughs> Allen, Dave Scott, you know, the Ironman triathletes, right? Mm -hmm. 2.4 miles in the water, 112 mile bike ride, and uh, a marathon run. I always wanted to do that, never did. I did half Ironmans because I couldn't wow. imagine doing a full one. But these guys would come off a 112 mile bike ride and run like a 245 marathon. This is the guy they went to, you know, for performance. And and he back then he recommended high fat, like the Wait, athlete, what, high fat or high high carbs. No, back then to some of the athletes he knew that fat was important, okay. but he couldn't talk about it. Ah, uh, yeah. It's just like the people with the 80s. Because <laughs> high fat, they took a fat out of everything. No fat caused heart attacks, you know. Oh like, yeah. And uh, anyway, now yeah. now now he changed his position 
on that and um, now it's becoming more mainstream then people yeah, are more accepting exactly I've got athletes it. right now I got athletes right now on the program he probably would have got shot out of the water if in yeah, the 80s he, he said high fat Any, anybody that makes any advances in medicine um, just gets get, gets hammered um, yeah. now and, and especially now we can look at people on a cellular level and your body like I've got athletes right now that are riding 100 miles on their bike really fit athletes 100 miles are just drinking water and they're and they're and they're on a high fat diet. Nice. They're not even eating any food. Okay, now you, you would have said that 15 years ago. They would have thought you were crazy. Yeah. But because I've always been involved in in the most innovative of ventures, I I'm kind of used to getting shot down. It's just like <laughs> it's like part of the well, part let's of whatever. Talk about your controversial background as Signature Pharmacy. How's that? Yes, yeah. So Signature Pharmacy, you got hired on there as a rep. Tell us a little about what your job was, what, who you dealt with, and then we'll eventually get into what yes. happened. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, my picture got shot around. See, it, it was a it was very very scary time. Well, what'd you do? What'd you do? Tell us. Well, Signature. Well, one of my buddies worked uh, for Signature Pharmacy. Um, Kurt Calvert, okay. a friend of mine. I just got done doing a long bike ride with him, and uh, he got off the bike and said, "Listen, Russ, I wanna, I wanna introduce you to the owners of Signature Pharmacy, Stan Loomis and, and Naomi Loomis." And I said, "Yeah, that sounds like a, a plan." You're ready so, to get out of paramedic stuff, because yeah, and and I was already I was I was already out pretty mm -hmm. much. I was I was already consulting with some of the research labs. I had my own nutrition program, so I knew Kurt told me Signature was doing about five million dollars a year in women's hormones, and um, I wanted to plug the nutrition part into the distribution channel. Okay. So I met the owners. We hit it off. You know, I got hired as the the, the director of research and development, and. Um, we were traveling all over the United States, training physicians and doing advanced treatment protocols. I even, I even focused on the women's hormones and, and developing. We worked on doing blood tests for developing a new long-acting growth hormone. Oh wow! Yeah, and um, the hormone therapy for men was a really hot topic. I knew from my years of endurance training that elevated cortisol and stress shut off all the hormones. So I took that. I actually brought on my nutrition program. I had a room upstairs where my vitamins were being made and being shot out the door through their distribution channel. So it was a win-win all the way around. And then um, the controversial part came when... Uh, well, the, the hormones and nutrition, like who did you, what kind of hormones and nutritional stuff did you do and what kind of clients did you have? Yeah, we had, uh, for act, uh, we, the, the Women's Hormone Replacement Program, we would do hormonal testing on women and do bioidentical hormone replacement testing for okay. women. With that, that was Signature's first market. As opposed to just synthetic junk, you'd give them bioidentical. Yeah, they would give them bioidentical. Suzanne Summers' book was real popular. We would travel from L.A. to Vegas to New York okay. to Chicago with our booth and give them presentations. I would do presentations and help educate the doctors on, on these advanced testing and treatment protocols. So, you know, it was, a, you know, it was like we were doing a great business. You know, it was, it was almost like a movie. I mean, it, it was people were flying in from all over the country to go through training. At Signature, it was a definitely an exciting time. We were, I was consulting with Major League Baseball teams and doing interviews and okay. putting together a lot of the uh, <laughs> a lot of the, the training programs. And then and then things went south really bad. <laughs> so what happened? Yeah, the FBI was involved. Right? Yeah, they the the federal uh, a federal agent um, came from New York City and and um, shut the place down. Okay, arrested everybody on site um, for distribution of anabolic steroids. And um, Signature ended up getting cleared, but it was a very scary time. My picture, I was on, I did a... Because uh, there's some news articles out there, busted, Signature, hormone, yeah. doping, yada, 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 and then a list of athletes, and everybody kind of came under fire. Yeah, that, and my and picture, my picture oh, got... Oops, we were wrong. Yeah, my right? picture got shot around the world on, on CNN for a while, and uh, the local <laughs> news, so uh, that's who you know who your real friends yeah. are. I mean, I had attorneys say that I can't be your attorney anymore. And, and I, I never got accused of anything. I never got talked yeah. to. Nothing happened to me. Um, but I was part of their management yeah. team, and everybody in the management team got arrested, so I, I, I understand. But when you go through something like that, um, you know who your friends are. And, and I, I mean, you know, my specialty was performance enhancement. And I work with high-level athletes, cyclists. I totally get it. Yeah. You know, I understand, you know. Um, you know, and one of the things that, w that we were doing, growth hormone can run people $40,000 a year. We were importing the growth hormone from China. I, did, I don't know if that was even legal at the time, but we were getting people on programs. Uh, uh, you know, a, grow, a growth hormone deficiency in adults got, got approved in 1996 to use growth hormone on adults. Yeah. And uh, I was training the physicians on how to use it effectively. And, you know, um, because a lot of celebrities and professional athletes were using our product, 
when they shut us down, it was like, I mean, we were, we were, I, we were judged immediately. Well, you, you guys know? were on the cutting edge of stuff that you did too. Yeah, nobody, your... nobody knew, nobody knows the whole story. It's obviously, yeah. you know, performance enhancement, and they don't know that the football players right now with head trauma, there's troops coming back from Iraq, are going to need testosterone and growth hormone yeah. to rehab their brain, to grow new brain tissue, synaptogenesis, neurogenesis, but. You know, you don't hear you don't hear about that. Look at the movie Concussion that, that just came out. Yeah. Let me ask you a question: Why isn't the military talking to the NFL? Why aren't they Why aren't Why aren't they designing programs for the troops coming back with uh, post-traumatic stress or chemical dependency? You know, why Why aren't we using the testosterone and growth hormone therapy? Right? Because it'll help rehab their body. You know, you can't just give them Prozac and Xanax. Yeah. You know, um, and and again, you know, maybe I get a little frustrated because I I was one of the guys that was first through the door. It seems like whether you're the first through the door, you're the last one to get taken care of, whether you're a cop, fireman, war veteran. Um, you know, and then when I work with a lot of the professional baseball players, I mean, when you when you see what these guys go through, you know, whether it's, you know, a professional athlete or Lance Armstrong, you have a respect, you know, for these guys. They are... They go through a lot. They are the one percenters. Yeah. I mean, you there's, there's a lot of similarities between you know, special forces guys and, and professional athletes. I'm just saying. People who see it easy, it's easy to criticize them on TV and say, yeah. I can do that and this and that, but they definitely train. There's a lot you see when the cameras are not on them. Exactly. And, you know, there's a bunch of guys sitting around a table at Starbucks and they're spandex overweight talking about cyclists using performance-enhancing drugs and they have no clue. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's, it's crazy. Well, you know, we'll talk we, a little bit about that when we get into our testosterone area. It would be a good thing to hit up there. Um... But let's uh, let's talk about addiction stuff now, because that was your signature. Bam, cleared, got out of that, learned a lot, built some business up, some reputation, learned, did a lot of testing, and you, and you were able to keep the information that you uh, tested, and you, you kind of learned from that. Stuff, yeah, I right? think when I was with Signature, even even after the the arrest, the people that knew me knew that you know they, they 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 knew the big story, and and Signature ended up getting cleared. But being out on the tip of the spear with Signature, like I was in the days of uh, being a, a paramedic on the street, it allowed me to travel to all the major cities, interview and talk to the doctors, listen to the patients. I went to anti-aging centers where I watched 60, 70, and 80-year-old people mm -hmm. on the hormone replacement therapy, using the growth hormone, watching their bodies resonate. Now, remember, I used to take people to nursing homes yeah. when I was a paramedic, and I'm like, why is this guy going into a nursing home at 60 and another guy's still on the golf course? Yeah. Well, now I got to look at all those labs. So by me immersing myself in performance enhancement and then the elderly market and then dealing with AIDS patients and muscle wasting patients in the elderly. That's called sarcopenia. Yeah. So I've dealt with all these people and I started pulling puzzle pieces together like I was back on the emergency scene, except now I wasn't in such a traumatic environment and I really got to work with some really savvy folks. And I just started to see things like, wow, we can make a difference in brain chemistry. We can make a difference in addiction. Um, the uh, Let's what talk I've, about addictions. Talk yeah, yeah, addiction. addictions, okay. Because everybody in this society seems to be addicted to something, whether it be like social media, okay, drugs, medicine, adrenaline, adrenaline junkies. That was me, yeah. You know, all of that. But um, so what do, you, what do you see happening? We all understand addictions, but let's see, what do you see happening on a cellular level when it comes to addiction? Well, yeah, and, and, and believe me, we, I've worked with a lot of addicts, alcohol, food, opiate, heroin. I help heroin addicts, you know, it off that that drug is is just evil it elevates your dopamine levels 800 yeah, percent know, which is which is like it's when they say you could be more addicted, so than anything yeah exactly it's it's the one elevation you know they got alcohol and, and oxycodone and heroin and when you inject heroin it, it's very easy to understand how it can be you could get addicted to it one time okay so so what's being said i've had executive clients clients that i've worked with go to we we get them on the wellness program and then I stay with them a while, and I find out they have some kind of addiction, yeah. whether whether it, whether it's alcohol, alcohol or, 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 or whatever. So, you know, I know talk therapy isn't is going to be one piece of the puzzle. You know, I know that you know the twelve step program only has a twenty five percent you know success rate. So, you know, I went to these addiction centers. I interviewed the doctors. I, you know, put together testing at my lab, mm -hmm. and develop programs that aren't being done in the addiction market. And, and I'm consulting with addiction centers right now. So all I did was basically, you know, look at what the best centers on the planet were doing. Yeah. And I, I said, okay, why aren't they looking at this, this, and this? They should be in order to rehab somebody. 
So you know, what are they not doing right? What are they? Well, I mean, you you know, you cannot you cannot treat somebody like. Let me give you an example. Yeah. Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, if you go into any meeting, it's full of you know Hershey bars, candy, caffeine. So I mean, and all alcohol is is a super carbohydrate. Yeah. So it's here they are. They're, they're they're not drinking, getting their chips, but they're they're banging down the carbs, yeah. elevating their serotonin levels, while they're actually in the Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. What I developed with my team is that every, every women and men have to be treated differently. Okay. Addictions are multifactorial. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, if we're all biochemically unique, then mm -hmm. how's one addiction program going to work for all of us? Mm -hmm. And I develop an addiction aftercare program where I'm interviewing right now with a couple of detox centers that help people transition in that period of time. Well, in order to turn somebody's brain around from an addiction that you're looking at about a three year process, we have to rehab multiple systems of the body. And, you know, you don't, you think about it, you come off a of heroin, where do you go? You go to Suboxone, which is another opiate, or you go through an assistance program where you're on methadone. Yeah. I've met people that are on methadone for 10 years. I mean, they just, I mean, what? Well, it's they, a, it's a money-making so, business. Uh, yeah, it's what a it business. Is. It's yeah. follow the money. Follow the money. But if you really, if, you know, I'm, luckily I'm with some very brilliant folks. I've interviewed neurologists, and I've had people sit down with me. My, my buddy, Dr. Stanley, owns an MRI center. These guys are always a phone call away, and I'm so blessed um, to have this crew of people that just, just make things happen because it's, lo you know, I don't want to, I, obviously I can't save the world. I need a team. But to develop these new treatment protocols for addicts, I mean, we could definitely do it better. So you do, you do your own interventions. What do you do that's a little bit different? Well, I mean, what, without one of the, giving away your secrets, tell us. No, 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 no. We it's Come okay. On. We uh, we we just look at different different metabolic markers. I mean, we look at. I mean, okay, so what does that mean? We we look Pretty at good. nutritional and, and hormonal deficiencies. Okay. You know, um, we look at how the environment. There, there's a lot of uh, environmental toxins out there that okay. physicians don't consider that that okay. could compromise somebody's body. Even even an addict, even what you rub on your skin, mm -hmm. if it's a chemical can affect, you know, people that are going through addiction. Lotions, soap, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, it, it causes, you know, toxins. Okay. So physiologically, we just we just bring a bigger toolkit yeah. to the addiction table. So you look table. at all those aspects. Yeah, and then we plug in a treatment protocol. And, and you also need talk therapy. Which, you, what, balances them out? Exactly. When you do drugs for a long period of time, you do alcohol for a long period of time, or you compromise multiple systems of your body. Yeah. You're not going to get well unless we treat all those systems at the same time. Gotcha. And most of the most of the addiction centers are just looking at one part. Yeah, they're looking at they're, they're the treating something in isolation. Just yeah. detoxing and that's it. Well, think about this. We weren't able to look inside the brain with fMRIs only up to a few years ago. Yeah. Now we can actually look inside the brain and watch watch the addiction. Let, let, let me give you something. And the cells yeah. actually firing up. This is pretty neat. You could Google this. This is called okay. Mouse Park. They, 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 would give, they would give mice heroin and okay. heroin and water, and a, and a mouse would come into the cage and start going after the heroin, and they would study that, the scientists. Well, number one, think about a mouse being in a cage, yeah. totally not his environment. Yeah. But this is what they did. They put the heroin and the water in the same cage, but then they put a mouse park. They had the, the mouse interact with other mice. They gave him things to do inside the cage, and all of a sudden he didn't go after the heroin as much as he did. Really? So maybe the mouse, like... Myself and the rest of us can't deal with dead air. Yeah. So now. So it's that time when you're sitting at home. Yeah. That off time. The off time. What do I do? Yeah. Hey. hey let, 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 you know. Let me come back into work. I need to. I need to come run emergency calls because. The dead air. I, I'd be running emergency calls. Those lights would be going. I'd be smoking a cigarette, inhale it as deep as I can, put my headset on. You know, nic nicotine is a <laughs> definitely limited. Nicotine limit. is a stimulant and a relaxant at the same time. And I remember smoking on the way to uh, rescue calls, running the scenarios in my head. You know, we got auto accident of five people down. I'm thinking, okay, I got to, I got to land a helicopter. I've got to start two IVs. They're giving me a picture of the scene. I'm running these things in my head, smoking the cigarette. I get out on the scene. I put my headset on. I start to call the hospital, and I am boom. I am jacked in. Yeah. And um, try to wind down from that. Yeah. You so know. you understand why you, when you, people you work with, musicians on stage, performers, athletes, what do they do when they sit around their big houses all by themselves? Well, one of my That's best... they get in trouble, right? Yeah, one of my best friends, and you know him, Eric Pace, he's a singer-songwriter for the God Amsterdams. He's, uh, we always brainstorm on ideas, and, and we develop content, like content like this book I did. Content is a new oil. So when I brainstorm with er Eric, he's able to... When, if, you, if you knew what went into writing a song... Oh you know, mastering a song. He really educated me, and, and I love him because he's a wordsmith. He, he and I brainstorm on how to educate people. A lot of my medical content, I kind of watch how he wants to 
develop a song or write a song and how he condenses and gets people to think about certain words. Yeah. Okay, words light up our brain chemistry. So um, I always run my content by him. So you're right, singers, songwriters, athletes, war veterans, the dead air, they can't deal with that dead air. That's, that's when they get into trouble with the drugs, the alcohol, the women. They're, they're looking for something. And, and like what I was doing, I was like, I was drinking a lot back then, and I wanted to go back into work and keep working. And, and that, you know, that, yeah. that's not healthy. And I was saying, oh, I was saving lives trying to justify it. But I, I didn't want to go talk to anybody either, Trent, because I didn't want that on my record. I want to get promoted up the ranks. I'm yeah. not going to say I had to go see a psychologist no. or a psychiatrist. And I didn't want to go see him anyway because, you know, they just treat the brain, you know. And, you know, it, it's, just, it's, 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 been a, it's been a tough ride, but I'm still just as enthused today as I was back then. Before we leave the addiction topic here, tell us about testosterone. What role does that play with the addiction? Because testosterone is a hot topic, and people just think of testosterone as, oh, my gosh, my libido, my sex drive. But it plays a bigger role inside the human body. But what kind of role can that play with addiction? Well, one, yeah, that's, that, that's a great question. Uh, testosterone, you know, testosterone is going to play a big role. I've, that's one of my expertise is on testosterone therapy, hormone replacement therapy in men and women. And a lot of doctors, even, even here in Orlando and, and in Florida, just treat testosterone in isolation. But you can't. You, know, you, gotta, no, you can't. Estrogen, too. Yeah, I mean, I listen, I work with all the bodybuilders. I, I know what these therapies do. I mean, this is a, this is a book here just on the anabolics, over 500 pages yeah. of anabolics and, and, and what they do and, and who uses them. This stuff is not going away, but here's what I'm worried about. Um, a lot of guys will go online and buy their own testosterone and start injecting it without any blood work. And listen, I get the fact that medicine is moving slow and medicine is broken, but if you guys are gonna take care of yourself, you gotta do it the right way. So you can't just treat testosterone in isolation. Like I talked to a doctor the other day, he's putting testosterone pellets in people. Well, if you put testosterone pellets in people, how can you control the dosing? If your testicles release 8 to 10 milligrams a day, and then you're under some type of stress, and a doctor inserts pellets in you, yeah. how do you control the dosing? So, you know, I don't, I didn't, you know, I don't, I'm not, I, I didn't say anything. I'm just like, okay, that. Icon intimidation, the guy in the lab coat. Yeah, the guy in the right? lab coat. So, so here, here's the deal with addictions, um, any, any type of addiction. Yeah. The hormonal replacement therapy has to play a role in rehab in the brain. Okay. Um, the troops coming back from Iraq, I mean, you know, or, or coming back from any war zone, their levels are all in the toilet. Rehab the brain. We need to rehab the brain, and testosterone is going to play a big part of that. How testosterone got to be a level... So vilified. I'm just so vilified. It's because, you know, I was right in the middle of that with the signature arrest. I mean... Performance, it, yeah. Yeah, performance enhancement will do. You know, what do you think an 80-year-old guy is going to need to stay in the game or woman? They're going to need hormones. They're going to need performance enhancement. They got everybody talking about, oh, osteoporosis. No, it's about muscle mass. Yeah. You keep muscle mass on somebody, they'll keep strong bones. Yeah. Like strong my, muscles, you won't break. When the bones. my mother and father were alive, they they were on the hormone therapy, and they you know they were in their 80s, and we were keeping them in the game. Now, it, they had to go see my doctor and four other doctors. I said, even me, with everybody I know, I had a when I was putting treatment protocols together for my folks, it was like I had to go to three different doctors just to keep them healthy. I'm like, what a bitch, really? Yeah. <laughs> Why can't we just have one one person? To one, do you it know, all. you know, one person. And luckily, the doctors that I work that work with me, they are truly that that five percent that get to get things done yeah. you know they get it you need those yeah. i do need them i mean we we have to work as a team so we hear a lot about testosterone okay uh and how it relates to mainly sexual performance people are like well i got low t i'm an older guy yada yada sexual performance so people sometimes when they hear testosterone they either think performance enhancement drugs or sexual performance enhancement but testosterone does so much more for the body for example cellular growth healing maintenance muscle mass uh, with your bone density, central nervous system, maintenance of opioid receptors, blood-brain barrier. I mean, there's just a, a list of a bunch of big words here that most people have no idea what all this stuff means and how it even relates to the body. So tell us a little bit about, um, well, let, first let's talk about what some of that stuff and what testosterone actually does for the body on a cellular level all the way around, you know, as opposed to just thinking that it's just for my libido. Yeah, that's great. The, you know, of course, professional sports cause a lot of problems sure. with with how people think about testosterone. And the commercials people, about. And when the president's on TV saying testosterone is, is, is bad and it shouldn't be utilized, that's like going on TV and saying thyroid is bad. Like giving somebody thyroid hormone is, is performance enhancement, but, you know, and I know, I mean, you can give somebody thyroid and they'll metabolize food a lot faster and increase their performance, but you don't hear anybody talk about thyroid. Yeah. So <laughs> they, they, there's a lot of myths out there about testosterone, but 
with the AIDS patients I work with, the yeah. cancer patients, um, the brain injury patients. Um, that's why we have our YouTube channel. A lot of those clients on the YouTube channel had utilized testosterone to get better. I, I designed a pre and post surgical rehab program. What did I use? Testosterone. Because as the guy's laying there in bed after surgery. Yeah. So and what does it do? Yeah, tell us what it does. What it does is it helps you maintain your muscle mass. Okay. It helps you maintain your heart function. Okay. When heart's, a, heart's a muscle too. Yeah, it, yeah. A lot of people don't, a lot, you know, they don't think about that. Mm -hmm. We hear that testosterone causes blood clots and heart attacks. Well, if you're taking 500 and you're, you know, 500 um, intermuscular milligrams of testosterone, you know, a week or every three days, and you're doing extremely high dosing to maintain 40 pounds of muscle mass. You're gonna you're gonna get into trouble because that you know when you look at a bodybuilder and and I get it oh that's that's my ideal I want to be fit I want to look like a bodybuilder and then you've got endurance athletes going I want to run you know a sub three hour marathon both those things are unhealthy mm -hmm. now you know I don't want all the bodybuilders going oh what are you talking about I'm healthy I'm like I don't know you know I I, I was a 150 pound triathlete and then I was a 200 pound weightlifter I know I, I don't feel good with all that muscle mass on me and you, you know you got the pictures. I'd rather be leaner and be able to run. And then in my mind, I'm thinking, if I'm 80 years old, instead of having muscle mass on me, I would sure like to be able to run a mile at 80, yeah. you know, in nine minutes. That sh shows me that I have cardiovascular yeah. function. So I always come at the testosterone therapy from looking at multiple systems of the body. How does the testosterone going to affect my heart and my brain? Okay. You know what I mean? So, you know, the programs that I developed for performance enhancement – looks at hormones, looks at nutrition, looks at the intestinal tract, and, and I pull it all together that way. Um, a, a lot of folks, uh, a lot of guys don't need testosterone. You know, they, you know, they... Because what, the, doc, the levels that you get back from your doc, you know, anywhere from zero oh. to a thousand, and then anything below 200 is what, considered low, so if somebody's at like a 220, the doctor can be like, oh, you're within the range. Well, right but, now, that's a good question. Yeah. The, the testosterone blood work, depending on, on the lab you go to, and this isn't just with testosterone, it's, it's with everything, everything right? Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a wide range. Uh -huh. So a doctor treats the patient, I always tell the doctor when I'm training the doctor, listen to what Trent is saying. I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I'm gaining weight. Not that you're gaining weight, but you know, listen to the patient. Because then the doctor looks at the blood work and he goes, oh, the testosterone range goes from 200 to 1,000. Yeah. You're normal. You're at 400. And I, and I got to educate the doctor and say, listen, he's at 400. His range goes from 200 to 1,000. Why don't we move him up to the six, seven, 800 range and then see how he's feeling, see if he gets a little bit more energy because all the stress he's under at work or all the mileages he's riding on his bike or running, yeah. it's lowering his testosterone level. Because it's the same thing. Whether you're an endurance athlete or you're a CEO at work, it still fatigues the brain, the yeah. body. Physical, yeah, physical, mental, and emotional stress lower all your hormone levels. Not just testosterone lowers thyroid function, lowers everything. And I guess that if I, I guess if I could say I had a specialty, that that'd be it. At the eleventh hour, I kind of understand how physical, mental, and emotional stress compromise the body and can lead lead to addictions. Oh gosh. Yeah. Um, okay. I lived it myself. I, I live with professional athletes. I mean, some of the fastest, most talented people, you know. Um, I trained with. I mean, I, didn't, I, I was never as fast as they were, but you know, I raced for about like 20 years. I did half Ironmans right, right out, right at five hours. I swam 13 miles around the Keys in five hours and seven minutes. I mean, I know what it takes, mm. you know. And I work with people that just have a head of steel, and um, you know, they will look for any edge in the world. <laughs> I mean, performance and well, well, let's talk about Lance Armstrong because that's a huge topic of what happened with him. So tell yeah. us what happened with him. The perspective of it, and then just we can go into the reality of it. Yeah, I, yeah, I, Lance. You know, there's there's a lot of hypocrisy in cycling, and yeah. I remember Lance Armstrong. We did a race. Everybody, we wanted to go do this race in Florida. Actually, I live in Florida. We went. I think we went to Aventura in the '80s, and uh, I wanted to go race down there because I could see all the top triathletes. Because yeah. as I was going out on the course, they were finishing. They were yeah. so fast. So, um, and that was cool about the sport because you got to race with the best people, and the, the guys that were in all the magazines. So I, we, me and my crew, we went down there and raced, and I was going out on the course, and, I was, and the winner was coming in, and the winner wasn't one of the main guys. The winner was, was, was Lance Armstrong. I think he was like 16. So, I mean, at 16, he beat all the top pros. So, uh, that early. Yeah, yeah. So, every, of course, you know, even controversy back then, everybody goes, oh, he cheated. And, yeah. um, but... When, like any, any professional athlete that I've dealt with, they always have that epiphany where 
whether you're over in France cycling or you're playing pro football and you immerse yourself in that culture, they get that wake up call and they see what everybody's doing. And everybody's using performance enhancing drugs. It's, it's no secret. And you either play ball or you, or you quit. But these guys are so competitive. Yeah. Um, and they're there to win. Uh, like well, I said, there's, a, there, there, there's no, the, the special forces guys I work with, private military contractors, guys like Lance Armstrong with that head of steel that they have, these are the guys that jump out of the helicopter that come rescue you. Yeah. That's the, you know, and I work with those guys. I mean, you know, that, that's the mindset they have. So they're, they're over there competing and everybody is doing performance enhancing drugs. What are these guys going to do? I mean, yeah. they're, they're competitors. Yeah, but well, you say, you say performance enhancing drugs. And so to the average late, you know, they say, or the, the, the average person, they're going to think drugs. Oh, they're thinking like heroin, you know, just the regular drugs that you would associate the word drugs with. No, so no, performance okay. enhancement drugs, let's, let's talk about what you would do to enhance your performance without the word drugs in it. Let's go ahead and what you would do with, say, testosterone or maybe some blood doping. Okay, good, good. talk about that. Yeah, okay, what I got gotcha. you. So, so from a bodybuilding standpoint, okay. maintaining, maintaining uh, 40 pounds of muscle mm -hmm. and posing, you know, you're, the list of drugs they're on is long and distinguished. Different types of testosterone... Decadura bolin, I mean, they're doing growth hormone. I mean, the yeah. list is long and distinguished. So now with the, uh, with the endurance athletes, they're looking more for performance and endurance, and they're doing drugs that improve their red blood cell count. Okay. Something like EPO. Okay, EPO elevates the red blood cells. The red blood cells carry more oxygen to the muscle. When you have more oxygen to the muscle, you have less lactic acid. So if you're doing the Tour de France and you're racing over 2,000 miles in three weeks, you're able to recover the next day. And they, they, they also use testosterone to help maintain their muscle mass and keep the cortisol levels down. Um, you got to do a blood test called hemoglobin and hematocrit, and that measures your blood thickness. Mm -hmm. So when you do EPO or you're doing testosterone, it, it actually makes your blood thicker so you can carry more oxygen to the right, muscle. Well, for a cancer patient or an anemia patient, this is life-saving. But from a performance enhancement side, these guys are experts in tweaking it. To, to take it, you know, they're, they're, they're walking on a razor blade, yeah. you know, but I understand it. I mean, I'm not, listen, I, I, just, I just study these guys. I mean, I, I work with them. I, I've done these things myself. It was prescribed to me by a doctor. I, I never did anything, anything black market, but I study this stuff because these guys are the canaries in the tunnel. Let me tell you what I learned from the bodybuilders when I was writing treatment protocols for AIDS patients. I used a, a lot of the same stuff they used. I mean, I, you know, they're, they're not doing studies on double blind studies on this in universities, yeah. you know, so you've got to you've got to drill down and find the information and, and do the lab work. And that's what that's why I partnered with these labs in 96. I was always able to look at different parts of the metabolism mm -hmm. and then make determinations on how to help somebody. AIDS patients losing muscle mass. Exactly. Bodybuilders trying to keep muscle mass. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Nobody nobody thinks about that. And they they say we developed some really brilliant protocols, but I think it's really simple. You know, like if you got a patient that just broke their hip, like I used to take, I used to take hip fracture patients. They'd break their hip. I'd pick them up at their home. I'd take them into the emergency room in the hospital. A lot of them would die inside the hospital. Really? Yeah, it's from a hip fracture. So I'm thinking, okay, now we can maintain their muscle mass. We could, you know, your muscles are a reservoir of amino acids and full fuel. So as you're laying there recovering from surgery, hip surgery, your body is mining nutrients to, to heal. Well, well, out of your muscles, right? Yeah, what if we gave them testosterone and, and some of these performance-enhancing drugs? To help heal. To help heal instead of, you know, having them come across the finish line at a faster time. That, that's where I think the disconnect is. Yeah. I, you know, and, I don't need performance-enhancing drugs. Yeah, I'm not yeah, performing. You well, know, your body's just got, took a hit from yeah. surgery or whatever. And, I, you know, listen, I, I run down the street here in Winter Park. I grew up here in town. Yeah. Everybody knows me. So they, re, they see me running down the street at, as a 150-pound triathlete, and then I got up to 200 pounds. I started running. I put more muscle mass on me. And they're like, oh, you're on the juice. I'm like, yeah, it's prescribed to me. <laughs> so no, tell us the difference between that, like how you felt. 150 pounds, 200 pounds. Talk about the difference in your body physiologically. Well, well physiologically, when I, was, when I was racing as a triathlete, I, uh, I damaged my body a lot. I really dealt with post-race depression a lot, of course. Okay. You know, I, I didn't want to talk about it. Because that depletes a lot of your... Yeah, de yeah after a race, you're just serotonin. done, dude. I mean, you know, I, I would... I'd swim a mile and a half in the, in the ocean. I would ride 56 miles on the bike, and then I would do a 13-mile run. That, that was a half Ironman. That, that's the best I could do. The first half Ironman I ever did, 
Took me seven hours. My last one I did, I was on a 440 pace. I finished in 507. Wow. I threw my bike in the car and I never raced again. <laughs> I was just done. I mean, I was like, I, I, I hung it all out there. I was done, depleted. And um, it was no fun anymore. Mm. I mean, I was in a sense of wonderment in the beginning because I was getting away from the cops and the firemen and the drinking. And then as I got more competitive in the sport, it just didn't feel right. So my doctors that, that were working with me, I, would, I, was, I was deficient in growth hormone. I was deficient in testosterone. So I used growth hormone. I used testosterone. I used it all to rehab my body over a, over a three-year period. severely damaged when you do yeah, that. Yeah, it was. It took that. me about three years to, to rehab my body. And, and again, I, went, you know, I wanted to see how much muscle mass I could put on at, at 50 but years old. But when people old, walk around and they look all jacked no, I didn't, up, they I didn't don't like, think that Yeah, I didn't like that feeling. That my body's I, damaged. I, I like to be able to run because running for me, only for me, is, is a natural antidepressant for me. And you've got, you've got opioid receptor sites on your central nervous system, and I think... By, by producing, you know, endorphins when you run, that just calms me down because I'm like ADD and, okay, yeah. you know, I'm all, I'm all over the place. But if I, if I run, I could give lectures. Like, I worked out before I came here so I could talk to you. You know, I'm not, I'm not too old. <laughs> well, I worked out too this morning, so, all right? <laughs> yeah, the only not, one that's showing you're 20 up. years younger than me. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, how about, uh, well, let's talk about, because we're on testosterone, but let's move into, since we're on endurance athletes and stuff, and athletes, let's talk about how, the endurance side of the sport damages the gut and the heart because a lot of people don't think about yeah. that. Well, look, I can run a marathon. I can do a Disney marathon that's, what, a quarter marathon, a half marathon, and then the third day you do a full marathon. I can do the three days in a row. Look at me. I'm super fit. Yeah, that's called a goofy. Yeah. <laughs> so how does that damage somebody's heart where they might not be thinking about it? Yeah, what do I say to somebody? And I have people like that because, like I said, I – What do you tell them? I, they, I, they can do I a still, marathon. No, I, I – uh, I'm fit. What are you talking about? I still deal with all the endurance athletes here yeah. in town, but I, I help them when they get sick. And I've got guys right now that are coaches. Jeff Cutterback's a coach. Rob Beans is a coach. But – they never call me because I think they they think I'm going to steal their clients. I'm not. I, I just want to make sure everybody stays healthy. And it, it's crazy, but I'll have people that say, "Listen, Russ, I want to do the, you know, I want to do the marathon, the half marathon, and the they want to do those three so races." A lot of people back. train for a year to do what one or two marathons. Yeah, a year. and and physiologically, I don't think they know. Listen, I'm all for the challenge. Yeah, sure. I'm all for climbing yeah. K2. Not but think that down at all. The mountain climbers are sharp. They're they're the sharpest people on the planet. They actually pass dead bodies on the way to the top of K2 on Mount Everest. They pass frozen bodies. So wh what a reminder. Yeah, right. When you're, when you're running a marathon, physiologically, it's like taking your car across the United States. Don't you want to get some baseline blood work? And maybe people just don't, don't do that. I mean, they're getting better, but that stuff really damages your body. I mean, I, was a, you know, I thought I was healthy with fast race times, and I'm hanging out with 40, 50 people. I'm doing 100-mile bike rides. Not at a fast pace, but on every Sunday morning out in a place called Windermere. Yeah. And um, Well, let's talk about like the heart. So what does it do to the heart? When you run a marathon or you're running for that long, and it does the, the uh, arteries in the heart, and what does it do to the arteries? And then, and then that downtime is when it's really dangerous, right? Yeah. When so you, tell us about that. When you run, difference. first of all, our bodies are not designed um, – to keep our heart rate up. Like a lot of these athletes run intervals to get faster and they keep their heart rate between 160 and 180. Mm -hmm. That could damage the electrical pathway of the heart. Like I have, there, there's a, there's a arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. And again, I don't know more. I don't, the cardiologists get upset because I've been collecting data on athletes, you know, since 1984 mm -hmm. on atrial fibrillation on the arrhythmias because I was a paramedic putting people on a monitor and then I'm racing as a triathlete. And then I started seeing these tri triathletes with arrhythmias. So I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to, collect this data. Well, now when I bring this into a cardiologist, he says, well, you know, are you a doctor? I'm like, no, but, you know, we've been collecting data since Four 84. Years. You got a marathon runner or an atrial fibrillation. You may want to take a look at this. And that's kind of, mm. it, it, there's sort of a reverse icon intimidation. I know doctors don't know everything and they need help, but doctors look at me and think, oh, since you're a guy, mm -hmm. you know, how can you have all this information? So, you know, it's, it, it goes both ways. So you could damage the electrical pathway of your heart, okay? You could, um, with the high carbohydrate diet, you could cause imbalances in your intestinal tract. Um, with every foot strike, you, you, see, you, you strike the ground with your foot when you're running, that's called compression hemolysis. That's a big word that says you, you break up red blood cells with each foot strike. Yeah. Listen to this. With each mile you run, your intestinal tract bleeds a little bit. Oof. Yeah, so these are the things that, you know, nobody talks about. How about the expansion and contraction of the arteries around the heart? Yeah, well, when and you train, yeah, when you do, when you do, um, the lining of the arteries is called the endothelial lining. Mm -hmm. um, I videotape marathon runners 
on the Russ Scali YouTube channel and other triathletes that I work with that have had heart attacks. Well, why did that happen? And this is, you know, a, a cardiologist will sit and look at an athlete that's tan, fit, you know, they look really good, and all of a sudden, yeah. and, and they're like, well, they're, you, how, how could you have a heart attack? Well, it's the training. The mm -hmm. training can damage the lining of the arteries, and that's some of the new stuff we're going to talk about in the next few video shoots we do. I'm going to show you how, how, how you damage the arteries that way, or the endothelial lining. You know, actually racing, racing and training for a marathon can be very damaging and unhealthy for you. But, you know, you got to be careful. People are still going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, he's going to do it smart. Yeah, you, you just want to do it smart. Now, like I said, I'm not trying to ring in anybody's goals. But, you know, I always ask people, I said, if you, got, if you, if you guys are going to drive from here to uh, uh, California in your vehicle, what are you going to test? Oh, well, we're going to look at the tires, the oil and everything like that. I go, okay, change, if yeah. you're going to run a marathon, what are you going to, what are you going to test? Spark like, plugs. Nothing. We're not gonna well, nothing. I'm just gonna eat uh, my protein shakes. Yeah, exactly. And drink these uh, energy drinks. Smoothies. That's why we shot that video. Smoothies make you fat. Smoothies. Sugar, sugar, sugar. Yeah. All right. Good deal. So let's go into some. Uh, let's talk about fasting now. Carbs, no carbs, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah. intermittent fasting, carbs versus uh, um, high fat diets, all that kind of stuff. So let's see. Uh, ketogenic diet. Hot topics. Fasting and the ketogenic diet. Tell us your experience with the ketogenic diet. Like, how, when did you first become introduced to it? Yeah, and, and this is one of the great things about living. I was living and racing with really fast triathletes. I mean, these 800 people would start a race. These guys would come across the finish line first. Cole Blair, Jeff Cutapak, Patrick Davis, um, the Picciano brothers would run close to a four-minute mile. These are the guys that I was hanging out with, and, and I would just watch them, and they were, they were so gifted. Um, what was I going to say? The what? ketogenic diet. Okay, okay. Where sorry. did you start doing it? Okay. you got the book about the carbs. Okay. But yeah. he was only prescribing fat to certain people because otherwise he gets shot down. Okay, that, but, okay. But okay. you eventually realized, like... Yeah, yeah okay, here, 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 here it is. Okay. I'm fading a little. So, um... <laughs> Stay focused. Stay yeah. with me. I know, okay, hang on a minute. All right. I mean, we had a video. We shot it. What's his face? He told us about it. I know, it's true. So, can I just get into it right now? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so... My group, it's 2016 now, the hot topics are the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting. We started that in 96. Okay. So I started doing research, and, and I'm looking around. like I'm, I'm like, why are these, you know, we're riding 400 miles a week. I'm looking at all these marathon runners. In the town I was in, has more endurance athletes than just about anybody in Florida. So I'm looking around, I'm like, why are these people fat? I'm just saying, <laughs> including myself, I had, my body fat was like at 20%. Yeah. And I'm like, what, what am I doing wrong? So anyway. We started doing the ketogenic diet. You were doing high carb. Yeah, I was doing high carb. You would do coffee in the morning, cookies. And yeah, cookies and carbs. And I, I called the owner of Power Bar, bro, Brian Maxwell, yeah. when he was alive. And he sent us a case of Power Bars for the SWAT team and for my training guys. Yeah, yeah tell us about that. And, and, and the Power Bar has about, I think, 10 different sugars in it. I handed them out during a stakeout while I was on the SWAT team. Like half the team fell asleep. And they're like, <laughs> because of that yeah. serotonin yeah. burst, they're like, dude, those bars were designed to eat motion. But like I said, in motion. What did we know? Yeah. But because I was with, um, because I was living with these athletes and we were training every day back then, uh, I, I just asked questions. You yeah. know, just like I was when I was a paramedic. I mean, what the hell? Why is everybody heavy? What causes what causes weight gain? So we, you know, I said maybe we don't need carbohydrates. So we cut the carbohydrates out of the diet. Oh my god. Well, it's not an essential nutrient. Essential yeah, fatty it is. Acid, it is. Essential amino acid. I, I didn't know that. Essential carbohydrate. Didn't know no. that back then. I, that, you know, that, that, that's one of my lines right now. When DNA unzips on a cellular yeah. level, you have essential protein, essential fatty acids. There's no such thing as essential carbohydrate. No. So, so back then we're playing with it, right? And and one of my buddies, he's in the video, Patrick Davis. He got shredded. Another guy was on. I went on it myself, and I'm dropping weight for the first time. And here's what was really interesting. I was able to recover. Mm. Like, I, I didn't have any athletic gifts. I mean, I had to work for everything, but I noticed. Just do most I, I, of us. I, I, yeah, I know. I noticed, like, after a 13-mile run, I would do one long run a week with a group that I recovered in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, this, this is a fluke. Because we used to actually, everybody would bring home a bag of ice, and we would dump it in a big trash can, and we would stand in it Oof. at my house after the training days. Like, my house was a local triathlon. Your ankles and feet. Yeah, yeah. We, we would just soak ourselves in the cold water, right? So, and it would help us recover. So then, um, then we started the ketogenic diet. We started limiting, we started increasing our fat. And uh, I noticed recovery. I noticed that 
my sex drive went up, which my testosterone levels went up because naturally, you, right? naturally, yeah. So now, now when we want to elevate somebody's testosterone levels, we improve, we increase their fat or increase the egg yolks. So on a cellular level, what does it do, kind of on a cellular level? On a cellular level, you got these little mitochondria. Mitochondria, like think, it, th think, think of your cell as a big water balloon. All mm -hmm. right, inside there is this little round battery called your mitochondria. This diet. Like the testing I've done on you, I'm testing how your mitochondria is utilizing carbohydrates, fats, and protein. And what That's we're right. learning now is, on a cellular level, your body will utilize fat. Krebs cycle, right? The Krebs what cycle. That's how our body produces energy, whether it's a brain cell or a muscle cell. Mm -hmm. So now we're able to test people on a cellular level. And then by adding a high-fat diet, you just improve their performance 100%. And it's not only that. It's being used as a cancer therapy. It's releasing something in the brain called brain-derived neurotropic factor. So, you know, Jim Abrams, the Hollywood producer. Yeah, tell us about that. This is truly amazing. And, and, and there's, these stories are all over. You just got to find them. Yeah. Jim Abrams was a Hollywood producer. His son was having like over 100 seizures a day. He went to five neurologists. Nobody got any answers for him. He even, he even went to a neurologist that recommended surgery. He had surgery on his son. And his son was continually having these seizures. So he started doing research on his own. And he started researching the ketogenic diet to stop seizures. In the early 1900s, the ketogenic diet was used to stop seizures. This guy, a Hollywood producer, drilled down on it, found out. He talked to the neurologist about it, and they shot it down. They yeah. said, no, it won't work. He put his son on a diet anyway. Within a week, his son's seizures stopped. Wow. So this guy, of course. Makes a movie about it. Yeah, he makes a movie about it because first do no harm. Meryl Streep's in the movie, and because of his passion and dedication, he started a foundation that focuses on the ketogenic diet wow. and how it stops seizures. Well, that's amazing. What I see in the future is, like I said, I've got athletes on this performance-enhancing diet right now riding their bike 100 miles, and they're not taking in any food, and this high-fat diet is powering them through 100 miles, where before, when I would ride 100 miles, I'd be slamming bananas, power bars. My body was used yeah. to burning glucose, but once you get your body used to burning fat, yeah. that's what I do for ketones. these guys now. I mean, ketones. Yeah. Uh, ketones is a byproduct of fat. And there's more it's, energy to be outputted with the ketones. Exactly. Your brain glucose. and your heart utilize ketones more efficiently than sugar. And I'm, that's like, I mean, here, this Noakes, this guy, I love this guy. He was a guy I followed. Yeah. All through the 80s and 90s, brilliant. And yeah. now he's even on. He's even saying right now, no, I was wrong with the carbohydrates. This book's all about carbohydrates, right? Well, there's, there's. He, he was talking about for performance, performance enhancement, enhancement. He was a carb guy back in the day. Um, there's much more in this book besides just diet, but injuries and, and how to train for a hundred mile race. He studied all the distance runners, but he was a big carbohydrate pro proponent back in the day. Yeah. Now, 2016. Like, no, whoops. No, he said, whoops. He said, listen, we, we utilize fat better for performance. And the guy that just won the Western States 100-mile run, I believe his name is Olson. He, he runs a 100-mile run. He's on a high-fat diet. So this whole paradigm, again, is changing. Yeah. And, and that's sort of where I go, whether it's being the first paramedic in the street, administering drugs, working with a, an advanced research lab in a cutting-edge pharmacy that gets busted or or now moving into these advanced treatment protocols, um, things are changing in real time right now, Trent. It's really exciting. Well, that's where a lot of the ketogenic stuff is getting kind of popular because in our society where we eat way too much in a, in a diabetic, insulin-resistant society, they're using the ketogenic diet to help with diabetes and reduce that and even reverse the effects of that too. Yeah, imagine that right now. Uh, there's a diabetic center here in Orlando that has 10,000 patients. We could go in there right now and turn that whole center around the whole diabetic treatment protocol is completely wrong. There's nutritionists saying right now that you need 100 grams of carbs a day. You do not need 100 grams of carbs a day. The studies are out there. The studies are being done. So much glucose to just power a little bit of part of your brain and your body produces enough. Think about it. You've got 1,000. You have 1,000 teaspoons of sugar in your body. Circulating glucose in your body is maybe one teaspoon. One teaspoon. One. Half a slice of bread will shut off fat burning. A half a slice of bread. All these kids that are getting up in the morning and eating cereal and... Yeah. They're elevating their insulin levels. But, you know, you, again, you got to drip on these people slowly because can yeah. you imagine telling a mom that their son or their daughter doesn't need three meals a day and they, they would have a heart attack? What do you mean? What do you mean? Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And that's that's why, you know, you got to clean the chalkboard in people's heads it's, that yeah. it's training. New religion. It's, it, it is, dude. It, it uh, is. Well, intermittent fasting. Let's talk about intermittent fasting because you mentioned three meals a day. Most people are like, well, I eat five or six meals a day, small meals a day. And, you know, 
that has its own different effects on you know, the pancreas and in, insulin and stuff. But tell us about intermittent fasting, what people are doing with that and the results they're seeing. Yeah, let me, let me first say this. I think the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting are great tools. But I also belong to a couple of Facebook pages where I'm trying to help folks that are on the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting. And you've got to remember that some of these people come into these diets nutritionally and hormonally deficient. Huh. And when they start the diet, it's another stress to their body and they're having problems. And everybody's saying, hang in there, be strong. And it's, it's not about that. It's about getting a baseline blood work and knowing where you are. First. Because if you start this diet deficient, it, it, it could make your symptoms worse. Gotcha. You know what, you know what I'm there saying? Is a, there's so, a catch-22. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Just, you, got, you just got to be careful. If you've been obese for like 30 years and you start this diet, you know, that, that's going to be a stretch. Yeah. You know, you've got to get your okay. nutrition hormones in balance. So intermittent fasting, I mean, what an amazing tool. And it's basically how we've been eating for 2.5 million years. Okay. okay, you know, hunters and gatherers. Yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, we, we, were, we were able to get up and, and, and do something called persistent hunting. Mm -hmm. Persistent hunting is we, we were actually, because we had no hair in our body, we were upright hominids, we could chase an animal down by walking and running. The, the animal that was covered with hair would basically have a heat stroke, and we would track that animal walking. It's called persistent hunting. We would kill it and eat it. Okay, that's that's what we did, you know, all morning hundred, long over the course hundreds of, what, of thousands five, six of hours. years ago. The the most dangerous animal on the Serengeti was the human because we were able to travel long distances. Mm -hmm. We were able to sweat, so we would get up. We wouldn't have a bowl of cereal or a power bar. Wow. We would no toast. We we would go out and 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 hit the ground and start looking for food. Mm -hmm. So genetically, we are hardwired not to eat three meals a day. Genetically, we are hardwired to be in a fasting state to be in a ketogenic state. So um, when you do intermittent fasting, and I put my, a, lot, a, a lot of my clients on an intermittent fasting program, but I get their brain chemistry and their hormones in balance first. Gotcha. Because if, if I got people banging down the carbs for 20 years and, and then they stop, and then they stop, they're going to lower their serotonin levels in their brain and, you know. Go south quick. Yeah, I don't want to be the, I'm, and people know me, I'm not the food Nazi. I kind of see where, there are, see where they are and plug in something that works. And I know some of your clients eventually they come around to it and they think, wow, why didn't I you know, try this? Or they, it takes time to adjust to it, then they're able to do it. Yeah, right. And jump right. onto it. It's not just right away. And there's several different types of intermittent fasting. There's a 24 hour fast, and then you just you know, fast all morning long or 18 hours, and then eat whatever you kind of want in the afternoon time. So there's plenty of stuff out there on different types of fasting that you can kind of look at. I like to, uh, you know, I plug in, like if I'm, if I'm doing a discovery and I meet somebody and we're sitting here talking and they're banging down the rolls at the dinner table, I'm kind of figuring they're under a lot of stress because yeah. the. You know, those roles, I call them poor man's Prozac. So what do you say when you, you, you know, I'm like, with Yeah, folks, I just the watch them. Grab the roles. Yeah, if, they're, if they got a lot of rolls or a lot of alcohol in their liquor cabinet, I'm like, okay, their brain chemistry. And again, I don't, I don't tell them not to drink and I don't tell them not to eat cars. My point is, when I see their behaviors and what they're doing, just like back when I was a paramedic, I said, okay, I am not cutting carbs out of this guy's diet. Like, I just, I just mm. met, a, I met a guy from NASA that's a rocket scientist. He's a consultant. And... Um, he wants me to work with his diet. Well, he's got a history of AA, and he eats a lot of carbs. So here he was, an alcoholic. He's eating a lot of carbs right now. I'm, I'm not going to cut the carbs out of his diet. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to. You know, we're, we're just going to get a baseline and, and help him. So let's see. York University in Toronto did a study. Uh, why we're getting fatter over the course of 30 years, okay? And it's not because of uh, food, they were saying, for the most part. Uh, they list those as uh, prescription drugs, chemical exposure, altered gut environment, junk food marketing, dehydration, that kind of stuff. Okay, okay. So, whereas people think like, well, yeah, your diet has a lot to do with it too, but a lot of people don't think about the environment around you and how that affects on you and makes you, or can affect someone's state. No, I like that. So tell them about that. Yeah, you know, no, 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 and, and, and that's true, you know, weight loss, we used to think calories in, calories out. Yeah. And the doctor would say you need to exercise, but then I got marathon runners that finish a marathon and they're obese, so... People, we're trying. the whole other topic. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, yeah, we're trying to help people get out of the railroad tracks. It's not about exercise. So weight loss. How do you burn body fat? You know, and it's multifactorial. It's different for everybody. But we also know now because we do advanced testing is that if your intestinal tract is out of balance, if you have a bacteria or a yeast overgrowth in your gut, you're not going to be able to burn body fat as more effectively. And they're like, well, why is that? Well, you are not what you eat. You already absorbed. There you go. So in order to get the body to resonate. We get the intestinal tract in balance. That's why we test the intestinal tract. Yeah, pull nutrients out of food, right? Yeah, you're not pulling you nutrients out of food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Think about it. You need 21 minerals, 13 vitamins, 8 amino acids, 2 essential fats every day. Yeah. If you're eating food and you're not pulling nutrients out of food, you will mine calcium from your own bone. You will mine amino acids from your, from your own muscle tissue. 
So a lot of people, you know, don't think about that. They just, they just think it's diet or, or I'm just going to drink protein. No, that, you know, and, and again, it's about education. So what you said, the environment, a lot of the pollution in the environment causes elevated estrogen levels mm -hmm. on us, you know. Um, you, could, you could Google xenoestrogens, and when your estrogen levels are elevated, it causes cells to grow. It also and it, blocks your testosterone too a little exactly, bit. Exactly, exactly. That's good. For, so men with elevated estrogen that have the belly and women with high estrogen, it shuts off their thyroid. So this is why I tell everybody, you can't just treat testosterone in isolation. You can't just treat a woman with estrogen. Yeah. You've got to look at, a woman has three estrogens in her body. So the environmental toxins, what, what you rub on your skin can elevate estrogen levels. But, you know, you, nobody talks about that. So, again, I want to be able to educate people on the Russ Scali YouTube channel where they could watch that, get the aha moment, ask their doctor a question. Gotcha. You know? Makes sense. Yeah. Doesn't anybody just want the right question? They just um, want the answers. Yeah, I know. I know. Just want somebody to give them the answers. People and people. Russ Scali's pe YouTube channel. There you go. <laughs> Has all the answers. People, people are busy like. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, moms and. Um, I, I, I take care of the executives. This is going to be a good one. This will help people. I always wanted to teach men and women about their physiology so, so they would have more patience. So, you know, I, I know that the guys take a lot of hits. I always get accused of I take the men's side and I don't. you got a woman at home raising a two-year-old that used to be corporate, a corporate girl, and you got a guy out there taking the hits in the street, work, you know, running a multi-million dollar company. He's not going to want to come home right away. He's going to want to decompress. Mm. The wife hasn't had anybody to talk to all day long, so she wants to talk to her husband. So I, I tell these guys physiologically what's going on with them, and I have a consult with them. And they always go, will you come home and talk to my wife? And I'm like, I'm, like, I'm not a counselor. In fact, I'm the worst counselor on the planet because – I understand that the guys are running scenarios in their head. They're running a multi-million dollar company. All these scenarios in their head keep them busy. They keep focused. And then on that drive home, um, they, 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 relax. they, they, they want to relax. Stop. They want to wind down. They can't come through the door and get hit with a lot of stuff. So, And then the women, because I talk, you know, I, I have the Winter Park Dogs running group we started. We started with four people. We've got about um, 200 people in the running group right now, and most of them are women. And um, I, I run sometimes still with the group, and I listen to, to what the women say. Uh, they're at home, and they're used to being in corporate America. Now they're raising a child with a vocabulary of two words. They don't feel productive. Yeah. They want they want somebody to talk to, and you know. So, I'm I'm just thinking that if we understood, and you know, the brain chemistry understood fluctuating hormonal levels, um, couples would have a lot more patience with each other. You know, and I'd rather have them patient. You, you don't want me talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny there's professionals for that I mean I, I want to help as many people as I can but I'm, I'm not a good counselor yeah. that moves too slow for me <laughs> so uh, your company let's talk about what you do for your genetic and metabolic testing just to kind of wrap things up here a little yeah bit. we you know we, we started Scala Precision Health you can see Scala Precision Health our new website we've got a couple of centers in uh, Winter Park Florida right now the Institute of Nutritional Medicine more of the educational side of yeah things. the Institute of Nutritional Medicine and Cardiovascular Research still does a lot of the education stuff and a scala precision health is more focused on high functioning people um, you and I shot the high functioning video that talks all about high functioning people so right now we've got advanced nutritional and hormonal testing we've got IV therapy we've got stem cell therapy all within uh, the Winter Park area right yeah. now. and um, So tell us a little bit about your advanced genetic and metabolic testing, your cellular level testing. So what do you do? I know you look at, we talked about looking at the Krebs cycle real quick, but let's break it down like on a cellular level, like the mitochondria. So I got a piece of paper for you, Joel. Okay, right. okay, cool. So okay. tell us like what you do to look at stuff on a cellular level. I'm actually gonna. Okay, I'm gonna draw a cell right here. This is the mitochondria in the cell. Oh, here, and this is really cool. See, this is where the DNA is in the nucleus. In each cell, I think 10,000 cells can fit on the head of a pin. In each cell, you've got about six feet of DNA. Six feet of DNA in each cell. So the complexity of an individual cell is mind-boggling. But let's stick with the mitochondria. The mitochondria is inside the cell. It's a little energy pack. This creates cellular energy, whether it's in the brain or in the muscle. Right now, I'm able to measure carbohydrates... I'm able to measure fats and protein. And how that mitochondria absorbs those, exactly. uses, utilizes those to make energy, right? ATP, here it is, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. How the mitochondria makes energy, like the testing that I just ran on you, we're measuring your mitochondria on a cellular level. Now, a lot of diseases have mitochondrial dysfunction, which on a cellular level, people are just not 
operating efficiently. Yeah, exactly. They're not operating efficiently. So now, with some of the testing that we do, we're, we're able to look at the mitochondria on a cellular level. Whether it's a brain injury patient or a performance-enhancing athlete, we look at nutrition and how the cells are actually uptaking the nutrition, and then we adjust the diet. So it all that. starts with the cells. I mean, yeah. How they're performing. Exactly. And, and then that's why, you know, people that are out there just taking individual supplements or swallowing a handful of vitamins, you know, we're way beyond that now. We're, you know, this you is can, a whole paradigm change. You can tell them what supplements and what vitamins they actually need. Right. Because if they take the wrong stuff, it can push them off in the wrong direction. Exactly. If you just get somebody's gut, if you clean up their gut and their body starts to resonate and they're pulling more nutrients out of food... I mean, just doing that is going to help. More vitamins some, himself without even saying. taking the vitamins. Yeah, if you, if you clean up somebody's gut, you're going to elevate their hormone levels. So here, you say, say you got a woman or, 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 or a gentleman that's 60 years old. And, like, I had a guy come by me the other day. This is how I wrote, I wrote my muscle wasting program. I'm sitting at this restaurant scribbling and doing my ADD stuff and, and research. And this guy comes by me on a walker. And he's, he's taking like five minutes to go by me, and I see him struggling. His veins are distended in his arm. He's hunched over with osteoporosis. And he's walking by me real slow, and I'm thinking, why can't this guy go somewhere in the U.S. and get answers? Yeah. So I'm, I'm writing down, he's got inflammation. He's got low testosterone. He's got low growth hormone. He's got osteoporosis. It's intestinal attitude. And I wrote this, this uh, muscle-wasting program that, that, that you and did an excellent job shot the video on. Yeah. So I'm looking at this guy go by me, and I'm like, why is this guy not getting any answers? Exactly. And, and we could improve somebody's quality of life. I mean, you know, it's, it's, didn't we land on the moon, man? I mean, we landed on the moon. I'm like, what the fuck? Well, medicine is a business, so. And we got to change that, man. Yeah, we do. You know, we, we, we really, it's, it's, very, it's, it's, it's very frustrating. I mean, I, I, I know we can do better. And I know that's why I surround myself with so many brilliant people. And, and those doctors that I have with me right now, those those are the guys that are outside the box that are going to make a difference. You know, and, and what stays in my head is that one doctor in that hospital in Boston took care of all the trauma victims, and within a short time, all across the United States, trauma. there was trauma centers. So I think if we set up a couple of clinics with this treatment protocol that our team developed, I think it's going to go, it's going to take off. Because people, people, will, people want to stay better. They don't just want to take yeah. five different pills. In, in order to do that, you have to be proactive. So it takes a little responsibility on the patient's part. Exactly, exactly. But... People are already doing that. They're already researching. They're on blogs. They're on other sites looking for this stuff. They're I becoming smarter. I it's love great. It. They're becoming smarter. I love it. They're not intimidated by the doctor anymore. The, the physicians of the future will work as a team. They did a study, and they found that doctors are actually get upset when a person comes in educated. Well, hey, get used to it. Mm -hmm. People are going to come in and ask you questions. And if they don't have time, then, then they're going to find another doctor. You know, that, you know that's what's, what, what's going to happen. It takes a team to take care of you and your family members and, 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 and get a second opinion if you don't like, you know, you're going into a, a system, you know, iatrogenic deaths. Iatrogenic deaths means death caused by the healer. The iatrogenic deaths in the United States is through the roof. Hundreds of thousands of people die every day from medical mistakes. But you don't hear about that. You hear about performance enhancing drugs, you know. Yeah, you know. or you hear about the guns in the streets and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the medicine that we're all taking. Oh, my God. Yeah, get my kid on a low-fat diet and give him that ADHD drug, brother. <laughs> okay, so that's about it, man. Anything else you want to add? No, we're good. Yeah, Rise of the Smart Patient. We shot a video on that, so we can talk about that. Yeah. Rise of the Smart Patient. So become a smart patient. Become educated. Enjoy the stuff. Check us out. Russ Gala YouTube channel. All right, Russ Gala website. And feel free to email, contact. If you have any questions, uh, Russ loves his helping out and problem solving like that. So feel free. Get educated and uh, become one of those smart patients. Thanks, bro. Yeah. It's always a pleasure. Talk.